Hi everyone, my name is Ali Swan Qasmi. I welcome you all to um, the session on poetics and politics of sedition in, in Pakistan. And um, before we begin and formally introduce our, our panelists, I would like to, to read out land acknowledgement statement. We recognize that Stanford is an occupier of the ancestral and unceded land of the Muwakama Aluni tribe. We are grateful to be guests on this land and commit to solidarity to indigenous struggles. The, the purpose of this event to, is, is to actually launch two books um, by uh, Amar Rijan and Salman Heather. Salman Heather is a poet, Amar Jan is a political theorist, but Amar Jan's book also has a certain kind of political poetic quality and Salman Heather's poetry has a lot of poetic uh, political content. So that's why we thought it's, it's, it's uh, they, they, these books, they complement each other. And they, they speak to a range of themes that are important uh, in, in, in understanding what's happening in, in Pakistan right now. Our uh, moderator for this session, and I'll hand it over to her, is Professor Nida Kermani. She's an associate professor of sociology in the Mushtaq Ahmad Gurmani School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Lahore University of Management and Sciences. She's also faculty director of the, or she used to be the faculty director of the Saida Wahid Gender Initiative. Uh, Professor Kermani has on issues related to gender, Islam, women's movements, development, and urban studies in India and Pakistan. Uh, she completed her PhD in 2007 from the University of Manchester in sociology. Her book, Questioning the Muslim Women, uh, Identity and Insecurity in an Urban Indian Locality was published in 2013 by Rutledge. She's currently working on uh, issues of uh, urban violence, gender, and insecurity in the area of Leari in, in, in Karachi. So over to you, Professor Kermani. Thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Thank you to the organizers at Stanford. Um, again, especially Ali, uh, for putting this panel together and for giving us the opportunity to hear from these uh, wonderful speakers who um, both, uh, well, all three are excellent scholars. Um, and Salman Haider and Amar Ali Jan, both are leaders for us in terms of uh, intellectual leaders for progressives in Pakistan, uh, both people that I look up to a lot. Um, and so it's an honor to be moderating this uh, session with them. Uh, I will keep my comments very brief since I, I want to give time to uh, Dr. Faruqi and to the authors to talk more in detail about the work. But what I will do is I will introduce all, all three of the speakers. Um, and then I will just very briefly introduce both of the books, but then um, Dr. Meher Faruqi will talk more in detail about um, both of the books. And then we get to hear from the authors and then hopefully have a discussion afterwards. Um, I just want to mention that, you know, today is uh, the fifth uh, <clears throat> anniversary of the martyrdom of Mashal Khan. Uh, he was murdered um, five years ago. He was a student at Abdul Wali Khan uh, University. Um, everyone who's on the left in Pakistan knows him and um, remembers that tragedy. And I think it's really apt that we are having this event today um, on his five-year death anniversary. Um, for us, he's also a symbol of resistance and a symbol of progressive thought. Um, Amar also mentions him in his book. Um, maybe Salman has also written about him. I'm not sure, but he probably has. Um, so uh, Dr. Amar Jan is an academic and left-wing political activist based in Lahore. Uh, Dr. Jan has a doctorate in history from the University of Cambridge, where he worked on the encounter between anti-colonial thought and Marxism in colonial India. His book, which we're going to discuss today, Rule by Fear, Eight Theses on Authoritarianism in Pakistan, explains the political, economic, and social roots of authoritarianism in the country, focusing on the structural features propelling the rising militarization of society. Dr. Jan is also a member, uh, one of the founding members of Hakuke Khalk uh, movement, uh, say that 10 times fast, an anti-capitalist organization that is working uh, amongst workers, farmers, students, and women to build an alternative political project. They're doing some really amazing work across the country. Um, and maybe he'll talk more about that as well um, when he gets to speak. Um, Salman Heather is a former lecturer at Fatima Jinnah Women's University in Raupindi. 
He was associated with the Awami Workers Party, which is a left-leaning political group working for the rights of laborers and farm workers. He was also writing in support of the Loch and Pashtun civil rights groups and political workers facing state oppression. His political satire and poems were published by various news sites and magazines. In collaboration with like-minded artists, he ran a theater group and wrote plays along with staging three street street theater to bring awareness about issues relating to human rights and democracy. But as many of us know, Pakistan security agencies picked him and three other bloggers up in January 2017. And they were just uh, four people amongst several thousand others, many of whom are Baloch and Pashtun, but also Sindhi, Shia, Punjabi as well, but you know, mostly members of marginalized groups who have been victims of enforced disappearances, which Salman also writes about. As a result of massive international outcry and domestic protests, the security agencies were forced to release the bloggers threatened with violence, especially uh, trumped up blasphemy charges, and Mashal was also murdered on blasphemy charges. Salman Heather had no choice but to leave the country and seek asylum. He is currently working as artist in residence with Center for South Asian Civilizations at the University of Toronto. And finally, Meher Afsha, Dr. Meher Afshan Farooqi, uh, who will be commenting on both of the books, grew up in Allahabad, India, a uh, multiple gold medalist from Allahabad University. Uh, Dr. Farooqi is currently associate professor of Urdu and South Asian literature at the University of Virginia. Her research publications address complex issues of Urdu literary culture, particularly in the context of modernity. She's interested in bilingualism and how it impacts creativity. Dr. Farooqi is also a well-known translator, anthologist, and columnist. She's the editor of the pioneering two-volume work, the Oxford India Anthology of Modern Urdu Literature. Most recently, she's published the acclaimed monograph, The Postcolonial Mind, Urdu Culture, Islam, and Modernity in Muhammad Hassan Askari. Farooqi writes a featured column on Urdu literature past and present in Dawn, which is our, I guess, our biggest English uh, newspaper. She's recently published Ghalib, A Wilderness at My Doorstep, a critical biography. So we're really delighted that she's going to be commenting on both of these books. Um, even though she's gonna be speaking about the books, I just thought I'd give a brief introduction to the books as well. And then she'll, uh, Dr. Faruqi will go into more detail about the contents and try to bring them together. Um, Amar Rijan's book, uh, A Rule by Fear, uh, takes a historical and sociological approach and presents eight pieces that succinctly dissect the logic that has underlaid the security state strategy of rule over the past decades. And he begins even before Pakistan was formed and connects the kind of colonial period with the post-colonial period, talks about the continuities between both of those periods, and there are many. His book is really a kind of manifesto that calls on us to imagine a different kind of leftist politics one that builds on existing progressive social movements and that has the ability to challenge and overthrow the ruling logic uh, of the elite class, which is trapped in a neoliberal prison that is beholden to powerful foreign governments and to the diktats of the IMF. His work highlights the fact that Pakistan has been kept in a permanent state of emergency, one which can conveniently and strategically be used to suspend the law and constitution in the name of security. Sometimes this is applied to parts of the country, sometimes it's applied to the whole country, but it's always kind of looming there just to kind of keep people in line. Um, this ensures that citizens are kept in a per perpetual state of fear and insecurity, unsure of where the next threat is coming from. Imran Khan's latest assertion of a foreign conspiracy only mimics what the security state has been doing for decades. And the constant abrogation of the law and the constitution also means that citizens have little understanding or trust in the law because the state constantly violates the law itself. This Amar explains in his book is deliberate. He goes on to outline the repeated installation of puppet regimes, which we know all too well, uh, the control of the economy in favor of only a very tiny elite class the suppression of all the various identities that exist in Pakistan and the violent imposition of a monolithic Pakistani identity, which tries to kind of erase all of the diversity that exists here. The charge of sedition as a means of stifling all forms of criticism and dissent, which I think both of our authors have faced. The manufacture of periodic moral panics around religion and gender as a means of discipline and control of perceived opponents. 
the suppression of resistance movements throughout Pakistan's history and the mass cynicism that this has caused in the possibility of social change, which we're seeing right now with the current crisis we're going through. And I hope both of the authors speak about that as well. Um, but his book is not cynical. It provides, uh, he calls for progressive movements to come together across all of our differences and to forge a radical alternative to the fatalistic loop that we have been trapped in a call for a genuine democracy that is ruled in the interests of the majority of the people in this country through consensus rather than in the interests of the few through fear. Salman Heather's collection of poetry, Hashi for Likin Nazne, or rough translation poems written on the margins, um, highlights the experiences of fear and trauma in relation to state violence. A lot of it is very, very personal and very, very painful to read. He writes about his own experiences, but also the experiences of other victims of state violence in Pakistan. His poems deal with very painful issues that are generally shrouded in silence in our context. We're not allowed to speak about these openly, but he has the courage, even after going through what he's been through, to speak about them and write about them, which is extremely brave. He writes about the details of his own uh, disappearance uh, or abduction and other enforced disappearances. He was doing, he was writing about enforced disappearances even before he himself was um, abducted. Um, and a lot of his work, his poems, I think some of them were even written before. He can talk about this uh, when he speaks, he was um, abducted and seem almost like a foreshadowing of what he ended up having to go through. Um, he writes about extrajudicial killings, the targeting of religious minorities, his experiences of exile, the violence of neoliberal development and patriarchy and much more issues, all of which that exist on the margins of what, you know, the official discourse is or what we're allowed to include on the official page. Um, Saman Heather's work is part of a long tradition of political uh, poetry in Urdu, which I'm sure Dr. Faruqi will also talk about. And growing body of literature from post-colonial context that uses art as a means of speaking truth to power. Salman Heather questions the boundary that is created between literature and political protest through his own poetry, which is also a form of protest itself. Um, his writing, uh, his idea of writing on the margins reminded me of Gloria Anzaldúa's classic feminist text, Borderlands, the Frontiera, where she talks also about existing on the border, what the border means. He also uses this metaphor of the margins. So what exceeds the page, what's allowed to be spoken about, it's kind of pushed to the sides, but he's also articulating it as a form of resistance. So I hope he will talk more about that week, um, because his own work is also very much an act of political protest and resistance. Um, it's an honor for me to introduce all three of the speakers, but I'm going to hand over to Dr. Faruqi now for her more detailed comments on both of the authors' work. Thank you. Thank you, Nida, for this excellent introduction. And I'm honored to be a member of this distinguished panel. Um, and my role here is to introduce both of these books and also to provide some general comments. I'll try to be um, brief uh, as, as much as is possible, but let me just show our audience. Oh, okay. You know. by fear. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin by providing a context to poetry of the kind that Salman writes. Um, and as is usually the case, we always begin with the progressive Marxist writers movement in Urdu, which sort of took off in 1936. So the progressive Marxist writers movement in Urdu had created a space for revolutionary poetry. Inspired by the exigencies of the freedom struggle, poets such as Fez Ahmed Fez, Makhdoum Muhyiddin, and Majaz were able to reinvent the metaphors de deployed to express the universal pain of loving. The angst of love became love for the motherland. Love could also be hunger for freedom, freedom from the shackles of colonialism. Fez in particular ascended new heights in infusing the ghazal with emotions fired with the yearning for emancipation. And Salman even has a poem in which he addresses um, 
as Ahmed Faiz and Iqbal and Noon Neem Rashid and even Manto. Urdu poetry freed itself from the restraints of rhyme and refrain when feminist poets strode on the stage in the 1980s. The ghazal, essentially a poem of pain and beauty, was not an easy receptacle of the angst of gender discrimination, especially because in the stylized classical ghazal, the speaker's voice was not gendered. The whimsical beloved male or female dictated to the lover. The nazm, a poem that is anything but a ghazal, was the preferred mode of expression for feminist poetry. Free verse, blank verse was the preferred, free verse, blank verse, prose poems were able to absorb the poet's emotions. I mentioned feminist poetry because it resounded in Pakistan during the suppressive regime of General Ziaul Haq. There is a direct connection between the oppressive so-called Islamic rule of General Zia and the feminist protests against the cruel legislation that suppressed women's agency in Pakistan. Femida Riaz, the most articulate and strident among feminist poets, had to leave Pakistan for fear of her life. Nonetheless, Riaz and her peers and her peers created a tradition of resistance through poetry that has continued to grow. Amar Ali Jan's recent publication, Rule by Fear, Eight Thesis on Authoritarianism in Pakistan, is a remarkable succinct thesis on Pakistan's political formation, social complexities, and economic upheavals from its inception some, de some seven decades ago to present time. More important, Jan shows a path to go forward by shining a light on Pakistan's youth, students, feminists, farmers, workers, human rights activists, and all those who have not given up on the country's future. I met Salman Heather in Toronto at a welcoming mehfil pulled together on a frosty March evening in Toronto in 2019. My hosts were the emigre poets from Pakistan, the eminent Ghazal poet Irfan Sattar in particular, and Tahir Aslam Gora, the dynamic broadcaster, fiction writer, and founder of Jag TV. We sat in a cozy circle in the casual living room above the studio of Jack TV. Then the poetry began to unfold. Poets pulled out their cell phones, scrolled to pluck out what they wanted to read. I sat in captivated awe. Wah, wah, kya kehne. Hi, hi, punctuated the recitation. Eventually, the Toronto poets turned towards a tall, dark complexed burly man whose turn it was to recite. Salman had, the, and he's here with us. The next 30 minutes were mesmerizing. Heather's poetry connects us to Pakistan's political and social turmoil as swiftly as John's book. In fact, one could select a poem header from Heather for each of John's chapters. How did Heather find the path, the idiom, to poeticize in order to produce such startling poetry? This is a question for Salman himself, but I will answer it through my own reading of his poem. Poetry, even of the prose variety, cannot be just plain narrative. There has to be a current of energy running through the poem, an aching nerve or a shared emotion that connects it with the reader or the listener. Orality is an essential for Urdu poetry because the language thrives on its dramatic musical resonance of recitation at mushairas and metals. The classical requisites for Urdu poetry are balagat, that is lucidity, ravani, flowingness, iham, ambiguity, or abstraction, and above all, istiara, or metaphor. Since the content of Heather's poems are events drawn from real or immediate local circumscribed part of his world, and not from a stylized, universal, hyper-emotional one as, the, as created by Fares, he needed to find an unsentimental, stark yet stirring idiom for his poetry. He had to share the pain he bears, the horrors he experiences, but not seek compassion. Instead, he wants to provoke, he wants to arouse the listener and shake the listener out of complacency, complacency to awareness. I will give examples to show how Heather goes about doing this. A poem titled, Monday Never Comes, is a conversation between an unspecified speaker and a clerk. It is about frustration with the system that does not allow you the ability to choose. It is about namelessness. It is about erasure. Perhaps the undercurrent is about those who are erased, those who disappear and are never found again, 
those who disappear and are never found in the dungeons of the state. It is about repression, about laws promulgated to suppress individual will. Note that the speaker wants his name to be a symbol of freedom. He wants to be named after the sky, rain, bird, or star. And I'm going to read an excerpt from this poem, which I have translated from Urdu into English. The title of the poem is Sombar Kabhi Nahi Aata, Monday Never Comes. I want to name myself after a tree or sky, rain or bird. A star would be appropriate too. But these names are not included in the approved list. I have to advertise my change of name. And this can be only done on a Monday. When will Monday come? Monday never comes. Heather speaks of love too, broken relationships, unfinished stories. In a poem titled Sunbath, she paints a picture of lovers now separated, but remembered through his hearing words. The fragrance of your hand is caught in my tangled hair. The taste of your touch is preserved even now. Sunshine would lift the velvet from our bodies and winds would deposit it behind the slate-colored clouds. Then we would wrap ourselves in a quilt of leaves. Those moments of four seasons and the two of us are still there by the shore of eternity's ever-flowing river. The ju this juxtaposition of emotion turned to ashes is the cutting and the cutting cynicism of resistance to a cruel system forged by authoritarian forces of the government forms the core of Heather's poetry. Let me share one more example. It's a very short two-line uh, example from a poem called Tamga, Medal. Those who craft the ribbons for medals take measurements of the reach of mourners' cries, not the courage of the ones who die. And then I had something about the night of April 9th, but I'm going to leave that out because we all may want to participate in that discussion maybe later on. I'm going to move on to John's book. John's book and Heather's poems have, a remar have remarkable resonances. John's book is dedicated to the young political workers who dream of a just and egalitarian Pakistan. Indeed, the dedication gives us a clue that all is not lost yet. If the youth can dream, and dreams can be realized. I think when we stop dreaming, then the end is near. John has laid out his thesis in eight. John has laid out his thesis in insightful, precise chapters. He calls Pakistan's power structure a hybrid regime, a weak prime minister supported by the military. The prime minister can attack social and political opponents, but cannot censure the military establishment. Pakistan has not been able to shake off its colonial legacy, the structure of governance it inherited, because the power was transferred to the elites rather than to social groups. The state then imposed a singular history. It has suppressed the history of resistance. What stands out in John's analysis are his thoughts, are his thoughts on Pakistan's weird Islamic Republic, the games that politicians have played with repeated revisions of the state's constitution, abrogation, and so on. John comments on the bizarre entanglement of Western governments, Muslim dictatorship, and jihadi in Pakistan's political scenario. Religious fanaticism is used for political advantage. One of the biggest challenges is the definition of Muslim identity. Who exactly is a Muslim according to the state? In the chapter, Manufacturing Identity, John tries to detangle the complicated notion of Pakistani art that is the national identity. How is the national identity, Muslim identity, ethnic identity to be detangled from all of this? In a nation deeply divided along ethnic, linguistic, economic, and sectarian fault lines, the relationships between Islamic and national identity becomes fraught with anxiety over, over religion's proper role in the affairs of the state. The reality of the diversity among the practic practitioners of Islam who were to be subsumed under Pakistani Islam produced contested identities. And, you know, there have been a lot of work on how um, minorities such as the Ahmadis were pushed 
from being a Muslim minority into a non-Muslim religious minority and what it entailed for them. Protest against the state's authoritarianism is treated as sedition. Blasphemy laws enable the state to persecute almost anyone on trumped up charges. Sedition, being labeled traitor, is an instrument of torturous suppression and was experienced by both Hader and John. John was arrested and taken into custody for participating in an anti-state protest. The, of the officer interrogating him said, and I quote, this, these are the words of the officer who interrogated John and he has quoted this in his book. So the officer says, this system is irrevocably broken and your naive idealism won't fix it. Your problem is that you love this country too much, but people here don't value your love. They want obedience. I feel sorry for you because they have killed people like you. Leave the country before it is too late. End of quote. Jan was released the following day. Heather, a human rights activist, disappeared on January 6, 2017, and was fortunate to come back home 20 days later. But Pakistan was not safe for him anymore. To be accused of blasphemy is like having a sword hanging over your head, which can fall any moment. I don't know how much time I've taken, but I would like to close with an excerpt from Heather's poem that addresses the subject of both Jan's book and Heather's. It's a wonderful poem. Um, and it's called Death of Feeling Secure. You kept killing people to the point that the feeling of security became the target of your bullets. You snatched the innocent from the comfort of their beds, pushed them underneath the assurance of their vehicles, dragged them from the security of their families, snatched them from the succor of their friends, to the extent that they began to hear their own voice. Without waiting for anyone, they emerged from their safe places and found others like themselves. They stopped vehicles, put away relief for some other day, and raised their voices in front of your doors. Your weapons became fearful. The fingers on triggers became stiff with shock. When you were killing the feeling of security, you did not think that when people were scared in their home, they would become fearless on the street. So with this optimistic conclusion, I'm going to stop here and hand over the, the floor to either John or Heather. Thank you so much, Dr. Farooqui. Um, for those really insightful comments and for bringing those two works together. Like you said, they're very different in style, obviously. One is a collection of poems and one is more of a, a historical, political, sociological um, analysis of what's happening here, but both complement each other really, really well. And so it's great to be able to speak to them um, together. And I think I just want now to turn to the authors to give them a chance to respond. Um, and maybe we can start with Salman Heather. I know uh, uh, for the audience members, I'm sorry, agar aap angrezi se frustrate ho rahe agar aapko urdu mein session chahiye to maybe, I don't know, Salman, if you want to, to recite any of your poems in urdu and I, you know, if that, because I know translations were wonderful, Dr. Faruqi, but sometimes, uh, in the original, it's also nice to hear if you if there's anything you'd like to share with us, and then we can have some um, more comments from you and from Amar about you know the link between politics and your work. Thank you, Nidha. I have some poems, one or two poems, that I will read. इस नज़म का उन्मान है सफ़े से बाहर एक नज़म ये बलूचिस्तान से हमारे एक दोस्त हैं जिनको कराची से इग्वा कर लिया गया था और ये वाक़े जो है ये मेरे वाले इंसिडेंट से कुछ छह महीने पहले पेश आया था तो ये नज़म जो है ये मैंने उनके लिए लिखी थी सफ़े से बाहर एक नज़म अभी मेरे दोस्तों के दोस्त लापता हो रहे हैं फिर मेरे दोस्तों की बारी है और उसके बाद मैं मैं वो फाइल बनूंगा जिसे मेरा बाप अदालत लेकर जाएगा 
या वो तस्वीर जिसे मेरा बेटा सहाफी के कहने पर चूमेगा या वो चुप जो मेरी बीवी पहनेगी या वो बुड़बुड़ाहट जो मेरी माँ तस्वीर पर फूकने से पहले गुनगुनाएगी या वो अदद जिससे मैं किसी कैद खाने में पुकारा जाऊंगा या वो गुनाह जो कभी सरजद नहीं हुआ या वो इतराफ जिस पर मैंने अगवा होने से पहले दस्तखत कर दिए थे या वो फैसला जो इस इतराफ से पहले लिखा जा चुका था या वो सजा जो मुझ पर और मेरे लोगों पर बराबर तकसीम कर दी गई या वो कानून जिसकी बिसान से तहजीब याफ्ता नसने घिन खाते हैं या वो कमीशन जो इस कानून का परफ्यूम छिड़क कर मेज पर बैठता है या वो नज्म जो मेरे दोस्त का दोस्त कल लिखेगा हाँ मैं एक नज्म हूं मेरे सामने वाले सफे पर एक तस्वीर कैद है जिसके अद खुले होटों की एक बाच पर बोसा खिला हुआ है और दूसरी गुनगुनाहट से लिचड़ी हुई है इसके बराबर फ्रेम में एक फाइल और साथ वाली दराज में शायद गुनाह एतराफ और सजा रखे गए मैं वो दराज नहीं खोल सकता इसके लिए मुझे अपने सफे से निकलना पड़ेगा नजमों का सफों से बाहर निकलना जुर्म है किताबों को अलमारियों से रिहा करवाने की तरह संगीत बहुत शुक्रिया एक और नज्म जो है वो मैं आपकी खदमत में पेश किए देता हूँ हमारे यहाँ जिस तरह जिक्र हुआ कि आमतौर पर जो लिखने वाले हैं वो इन चीजों के बारे में आमतौर पर नहीं लिखते तो ये एक नज्म जो है ये अः उनसे उनके रवैये के हवाले से जो हमारे उसमें राइटर्स हैं या पोइट्स हैं वो इन चीजों की तरफ क्योंकि बाकियात की तरफ पॉलिटिकल सिचुएशन की तरफ इन चीजों की तरफ नहीं तोज्जो देते तो उसके हवाले से ये नज्म है ये मरसिया नहीं है मैं लापता हूं और मेरे दोस्त मेरे मरने के मुंतजर हैं वो चाय पीते हुए मेरी सिफात के बारे सोच रहे हैं जिनका जिक्र वो मेरे मरसिए में करेंगे मैं नेक आदमी था मैंने कभी एहतजाज नहीं किया एहतजाज अदीबों के मनसब से फर्कता है इसमें नारे लगाए जाते हैं जो अदब नहीं होते हुकूमत ने बेअदबी समझती है यूं तो मैंने पचास लापता होने वालों के बारे में साढ़े तीन नजमें भी कही हैं लेकिन वो इस बारे बहस करेंगे कि इन नजमों का जिक्र मरसिए में किया जाए या नहीं ये एहतजाज की तरह अदब के मकसद से गिरा हुआ काम है उन्होंने चाय मंगवा ली है जिसे पी कर वो मेरा मरसिया लिखेंगे मरसिए पर दाद हासिल की जा सकती है जो सरासर अदबी होती है उन्हें कुछ एक्टिविस्ट भी मिल जाए तो वो मेरी गुमशुदगी पर एहतजाज का ठेका दे सकते हैं उन्होंने इस ठेके के अखराज के लिए हुकूमत के पास दरखास्त जमा करवा दी हुकूमती इमदाद से एहतजाज के लिए दरकार कागज और कलम खरीदे जाएंगे और उस चाय की कीमत अदा की जाएगी जो वो इस एहतजाज की मंसूबा बंदी के दौरान पिएंगे चाय से मुझे याद आया वो इसी मेज पर बैठे मेरे गम में दुबले हो रहे हैं जिस पर मैं उनके साथ चाय पिया करता था लापता होने वालों का ताजियती रेफरेंस मुनद नहीं किया जाता वरना वो मुझ पर मकाले लिख चुके होते इसमें ना इस ना होने वाले ताजियती रेफरेंस के बाद चाय की रकम मेरे लवायत नहीं अदा कर सकते तो इसके बारे सोचने की जरूरत उन्हें नहीं पड़ेगी वो चाय पी लें तो खुदा का शुक्र अदा करेंगे लोगों के मरने वो चाय पी लें तो खुदा का शुक्र अदा करेंगे कि लोगों के मरने पर उन्हें उसके खिलाफ एहतजाज नहीं करना पड़ता सिर्फ मरसिया लिखने और चाय पीने जैसी अदबी सरगर्मियों में मुलविस होना काफी होता है वैसे चाय की जगह अगर कॉफी मिल सके तो एहतजाज को अदबी करार दिया जा सकता है अगर ऐसा हो तो मेरे लवाहतीन इसके लिए पैसे देने को भी तैयार और एक आखिरी नजम जो है वो आप लोगों की खिदमत में कंडम मेरे लेबल पर लिखी मुद्दत अभी बाकी थी जब उन्होंने मेरी खोपड़ी के पेज खोलकर उसका ढकना हटाया और एक नजर डालकर उसे यूं ही छोड़ दिया मेरे घुटने मोड़ने से पहले वो मेरे पैर टखनों की चूड़ियों से खोले मेरे घुटने मोड़ने से पहले मेरे पैर टखनों की चूड़ियों से खोले और उन्हें मेरी पतलून की पिछली जेब में संभाल दिया मेरे हाथ रीढ़ की हड्डी से बालिश भर निकलते थे तो नाक पर बांधने की कोशिश में नाकाम होकर उन्हें मेरी बगल में दबाया गया मैं बर्फबारी में कपकपाते बूढ़े जैसा दिखने लगा जिसके दांत अपने बीच खला की वजह से अच्छी तरह बज नहीं सकते कोनिया पसलियों के पिंजरे की टीलियों में इस तरह ठूस दी गई 
جیسے مقدس ورق اینٹوں کی درز میں سنبھال دیے جاتے ہیں وہ ان پر تانبے کے بو سے ثبت کرنا نہیں بھولے کندھے اندر کو دھکیلے گئے سینوں اور گھٹنوں کے بیچ پیدا ہونے والا خلا بھرنے کے لیے میرا سر استعمال کیا گیا اندر باہر کرنے والا میکنزم خراب ہونے کی وجہ سے زبان بھیچے ہوئے دانتوں میں پھنس چکی تھی آنکھیں اسے دیکھنے اپنے ساکٹ سے باہر نکال آئی دیکھو یہ کتنا دلچسپ ہے ایک نے کہا دلچسپ خوفناک کہو خوفناک دوسرا بولا خوفناک بھی ایک طرح کا دلچسپ ہوتا ہے تیسرے نے جھجھری لے کر کہا اور مجھے کچرے کے ڈھیر پر پھینکنے کے لیے اٹھا لیا بہت شکریہ سلمان صاحب تھینک یو سو مچ ابھی مجھے لگتا ہے کہ مے بی ول ٹیک سم ٹائم ٹو تھنک اباؤٹ دوز بیوٹیفل پونس آئی ایم سو گلیڈ کہ آپ نے اردو میں ہمیں سنائی کز دے مچ مور پاورفل آئی تھنک ان دی اوریجنل آئی نو مینی آف آر آڈینس ممبرس پرابلی کڈ فالو لانگ ایز ویل اینڈ دوز ہو کڈ ایم شیور ور فائن ود ویٹنگ فار فیو منٹس اینڈ لیٹنگ اس انڈلجنگ اس ود دا بیوٹی آف دا پوئٹری ان دی اوریجنل اردو Um, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Mahdi Dijan then maybe for your comments. Um, you can respond to what I said, what Dr. Farooqi said. There's a lot to respond to even um, Salman Heather's work and your work uh, really connect well with each other and complement each other. Um, Amar, also, I was really helpful rereading some of your book today, just trying to make sense of what's happening in Pakistan right now because I'm... I'm I know most people who are in the audience are probably following uh, the current kind of what seems like a sudden change, but uh, perhaps you can also connect this with what you're writing about in your book because you're writing about hybrid regime and um, military's interference in politics throughout history. Some people now are wondering whether there's a change in the pattern or whether we can feel hopeful. Some of us are desperate to feel hopeful after so long. And you talk about the atmosphere of suppression and suffocation really that we've been experiencing in Pakistan. Um, you and Salman, you know, very personally, but everyone who's uh, in any way critical of the state. Um, so can we be hopeful now? Can you shed light or make some links between uh, what's happening now and what you spoke about in your book? Thank you, Dr. Kirmani and Dr. Farooqi, Nizma uh, Kasmi Saab and Salman Bhai uh, for, for organizing this panel. And Salman Bhai, thank you so much for uh, your poems and all that you've done over the years uh, for the cause of uh, justice and freedom in Pakistan. And um, I think uh, uh, Salman Bhai's uh, poems kind of encapsulate uh, the experience of unfreedom Uh, that so many people across Pakistan undergo. Because it's, it's one thing to, to, uh, to narrate what has happened and it's another to actually try to, uh, try to express what people going through that experience undergo. Um, so I think one thing that's clear because uh, uh, one of the themes that Salman Bhai was uh, emphasizing was the problem of uh, the missing persons, the enforced disappearances in Pakistan, of which he himself was a victim very famously in 2017. And I think it is very important to remember that the Pakistani state, uh, as a state, if we for a second uh, stop thinking about different governments, but as a state, um, erasure is one of the key features of the state's uh, method of governance. Uh, So one, of course, is the erasure of dissidents. Uh, the most brutal example, of course, is the enforced disappearances, whereby the state shows its presence through its absence by, by, being, by, by, un, by uh, undertaking a form of violence that is disavowable, uh, in which there's no chance, no possibility of accountability. And it's very menacing because Uh, you see the worst side of the state, which actually is invisible. So we really have a form of sovereignty, which is without responsibility. 
without the legal procedures, without without the constitutional guarantees, and and that we've seen take repeat itself again and again, mostly on the bodies of uh, of people from the peripheries, whether it was Bengal uh, in 70, 71, or uh, people from Balochistan, Pakhtunkhwa, and also dissidents from mainland Pakistan. So I think that that uh, th this particular feature of erasure of, of erasure is very central in controlling dissent. Uh, another thing related, uh, another way in which this erasure works is, is what Dr. Faruqi mentioned, which is the erasure of our history, of, of histories that do not conform to the official version of Pakistani nationalism, which means the erasure of our cultural histories, our linguistic histories, uh, the history of, of Sin, the history of Balochistan, uh, the history of Pakhtunkhwa, before that Bengal, and even the history of Punjab. And I think there is an attempt uh, to create this fictional, homogenous history of Muslimness that is atemporal, aspatial, has, has existed uh, since eternity, will exist for eternity. And anything that disrupts that narrative is a foreign element, is a foreign element into the body politic of Pakistan, which must be purged uh, violently often which is why there's so much support in the managers of the state for brutal action against those who assert their cultural life rights. Remember, Pakistan was, uh, what, Pakistan in its early years witnessed uh, violence around language rights when Bengalis tried to assert their, their right to speak uh, and write in Bengali or to recognize uh, Bengali as a national language. So this is this is this is the key element of of governance in Pakistan, and this erasure is linked to shame. So anything that does not conform to the standards of the of the state, whether it is identity, whether it's its political opinions, whether it's the favorite party, which changes very rapidly as we're seeing uh, now, uh, those individuals or groups are made to feel shame for their existence, for their being. Um, uh, it, so, as I said, so said whether you are uh, a Sindhi, Baloch, or you're poor, or you're a woman, or you're part of, of a religious minority, uh, all of these are viewed as lacks within the kind of hyper-masculine nationalism that Pakistani state projects. And I think it's very important to see these two, two things uh, together. Uh, erasure and shame as as the central gifts of the Pakistani state to its own citizens. I would like to comment a little bit about the current situation because I think it's relevant to the book. Uh, as I suggest in my book, that anybody who's unable to to follow or, or meet the standards of the Pakistani nation state uh, is not only removed from body politic but is also called a traitor. Uh, which is where the topic of today's uh, discussion comes from, sedition. That these are seditious acts if you are saying the wrong thing uh, at the wrong time, at the wrong place. And a colonial law, the sedition law, is used against uh, dissidents in order to discipline them. And we, I still have a sedition charge on me. And this is something that's not just used in Pakistan, it's also used in India. It's a common colonial heritage that we have. And it, it, it's an, it's, as I said, it's, it's an attempt to discipline populations, to discipline memory, to discipline politics, and, and to create a political sphere that is controllable, that is manageable, uh, which is where the concept of a controlled democracy or a hybrid regime comes from. That the key decisions will remain with this unelected, an invisible power, which is the intelligence agencies and the military that will not directly intervene. They have directly intervened many times, but often the ideal situation is that they will not directly intervene, but they will manage the situation from behind the scenes so that they, they have puppets uh, who are the sandbags for all forms of criticism, but the puppeteers are not visible to the public. And uh, we've, you know, this, this policy of controlled democracy is something we're seeing uh, across the world today, actually, you know, places like uh, Russia, places like uh, even Turkey and many other parts of the world. But Pakistan has this uh, honor of, of being the one of the birthplaces of this, uh, this concept of controlled democracy because we've been experimenting 
uh, this since the 1950s. So that's our greatest contribution to political theory, in my opinion. But what happens is that of every few years, uh, those puppets, they start taking their legal or de jure position seriously. So that they, because they are, after all, prime ministers, they are above the, the chief army staffs, even if the chief army staff is the reason why they're in power. And this, this contradiction between the de facto form of power and the de jure form of power, or the material form of power and the legal form of power, often leads to serious conflicts between the prime minister and the chief army staff. We saw that with, uh, with Janejo, who was a prime, who was a puppet of General Ziaul Haq, who, got in, who had a falling out with Zia and had to be ousted by him in 1988. Then we saw that with Nawaz Sharif, who was manufactured by uh, the military establishment. But then in 1999, he had another falling out with uh, General Musharraf, who overthrew his government. And the latest uh, in this cyclical drama is, of course, Imran Khan, who is who again is a puppet who for the last seven, eight years, uh, his, his party was given the full backing of the Pakistani state, Pakistani intelligence agencies. The period in which Salman Bhai suffered and many of us here suffered was a period in which the intelligence apparatus was working overtime to ensure that they have uh, a cleansed political sphere with Khan as, as the head. So he's a direct beneficiary of the violence that we've seen in Pakistan over the past seven, eight years. And uh, now over the last few weeks, we've seen how he's had a falling out with the, with the current chief of army staff and he's completely suicides. And all of a sudden his supporters who used to hound us all for being critical of the military are using uh, the kind of abusive language towards the Pakistani military that we had never imagined using, even if some of us uh, had those feelings in our hearts. Not me, of course, I'm a loyal citizen. But that... So this tells you how frivolous Pakistani, not only Pakistani democracy is, but how what a frivolous project Pakistani nationalism is. That within a week, uh, patriots have turned into seditious people. They are using all kinds of language that are uh, humiliating for the military. And interestingly, now Imran Khan is no longer targeting a few people here and there as seditious. He's saying everybody in the parliament except his party and everybody in the, in the military uh, top brass and everybody in the judiciary and in the media who did not side with him is part of a foreign conspiracy. Our, so now finally a vast majority of the Pakistani public and even state institutions have become seditious, have become traitors. So really it is a land of traitors, a land of, of seditious people. And I think that's the only positive side to this drama that at least we have uh, we, we, we are in a situation where we can see, we can finally have a reckoning with this entire history of, of accusing people of sedition, of being traitors, and hopefully out of this confrontation, we can have a resolution in which we claim that anybody who shares time and space with us is uh, our compatriot, is a fellow human being, deserving of all the respect and dignity uh, and nobody should be forced to prove their loyalty again and again in order to meet the fictitious standards of a cruel and punishing state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amar. <clears throat> that, um, I, I hope you're right. I hope this moment is an opportunity. Uh, that's all we can do is hope, like Dr. Faruqi said, if our dreams die, then what's left? The end is near, and I don't think, uh, well, environment willing. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. we'll, we'll continue to be here for a little bit longer and still be hopeful. I think the problem is the puppeteers never come forward. So this is one of the issues, I think, and that's the worry for many of us, um, that this will just transition to another kind of hybrid regime. But let's hope not. Um, Dr. Faruqi, I think you had a few questions for um, yes. Salman. Salman so yes, can... I have actually two questions for um, Amar Jan and also one for Salman. So, uh, and, and I wanted to say how much I enjoyed reading uh, your book, Amar, and also of course, Salman Sahib. I love, I read your poems many times before I would want to put them aside. 
So my question first for Amar is, um, you know, you, you have hope your dedication to the youth and you know you feel that there is still some spark left so my question actually is about the jihadis what draws the youth to to become a jihadi and how are we going to how are we going to go forward with this strain of political islam that doesn't seem to be diminishing. In fact it's being fueled by the anti-Islamic rhetoric that we are surrounded with so this is one question that I thought you might, it might be a difficult question, but uh, I wanted to throw it at you. And for Salman Sahib, I asked you this question for you, that in your eyes, there are two things. One is the love of the love, and the other is the love of the love that you have passed on, which you have passed on, which you have passed on, and the political scenario ke bare mein jo aap nazre likhte hain to kis had tak aap faiz sahab aur rashid se influence aapne liya kyunki faiz ke yahan bhi wo mujhse pehle se mohabbat mere mehboob namang aur hai lekin aur aap ke yahan wo to nahi hai pehle se mohabbat nahi balki aap ke yahan itna tamam mohabbat ki baat hai ki it is an incomplete scenario to kya wo kabhi complete hoga what do you think about it aap kya sochte hain yeah thank you dr Faruqi. um i think there is there's definitely uh, a worry that with the failure of the mainstream parties in pakistan uh, and the kind of social decomposition we have uh, I mean, we recently just did some reports uh, in working class areas in Lahore. Our friend Professor Noshid Zaidi showed that there's 78% uh, of the children were anemic. Uh, so it's just like the situation is dire and there's a very real sense of state failure, of the failure of political parties to mobilize people on their issues. And the kind of infrastructure that the mullahs of the right wing uh, people have uh, is it cannot be matched by by the left of liberals at the moment, uh, and this infrastructure is not just in terms of the material infrastructure, but also the ideological in infrastructure because their narrative has been given um, a lot of space in in the mainstream. So there's always that danger. However, uh, even with all the crises that we see today, uh, the mainstream parties they pander to the right on certain key issues, but they're not religious parties in the classical sense of the term or, or parties of political Islam. And when we interact with young people at uh, in, in public sector universities and even in small towns, um, it's quite interesting that they perhaps they're not as beholden to, to religious politics as sometimes it seems like from the outside. Uh, they're very interested in mainstream politics. They're very interested in progressive ideas. Um, they, they're conservative and, of course, in their own ways, but they may not fit the box of an Islamist very easily. And I think the only way we can uh, fight uh, fascists, which is true for fighting fascism anywhere, is to uh, look at the reasons why people feel alienated from the mainstream, the reasons why people move towards uh yeah you know move towards delusional thinking uh you know illusions are interesting only if the reality has completely failed you and i think it's very important that progressive forces do not abandon pakistan completely do not think that this is hopeless uh, that they continue engaging and present an alternative social economic agenda this is the only way everywhere, whether it's a European experience or in other places, this is the only way fascism has been defeated. Uh, it will not be defeated just through lectures on toler toler tolerance or lectures on liberalism. It will be defeated with an alternative, concrete political project that prop that actually, uh, uh, actually responds to their desires, responds to their alienation, responds to their rage. And that's the thing with rage. It can go towards the left or to the right. And it's really a subjective thing on 
on whether we can build that kind of an alternative. I see hope whenever I meet young people, whenever I go into working class neighborhoods, that there is space. We will just have to work much harder. बहुत शुक्रिया डॉक्टर फारूक जी आपके इन अल्फाज के लिए जो आपने मतलब कम कमेंट करते हुए उसकी बात की जहां तक सवाल का ताल्लुक है दो चीजें जिस तरह आपने बताया कि कड़ी है एक मजामत की और एक मोहब्बत की तो किसी हद तक मैंने अपने जिसे कहना चाहिए पेश रफ में भी इस पर बात की है कि मुझे ये लगता है कि मजामत जो है वो मोहब्बत जो है वो शायद मजामत की कदीम तरीन शक्ल है हमें जहाँ भी नजर आता है कि मोहब्बत जो है वो हमारे माशरे में जहाँ भी लकीरें खींची जाती हैं चाहे वो जात के हवाले से हो चाहे वो मजहब के हवाले से हो चाहे वो क्लास के हवाले से हो वो इन लकीरों को धकेलने की इनके पार जाने की कोशिश करती है वो स्पेस क्रिएट करना चाहती है ज्यादा से ज्यादा जहाँ इश्तराक हो चीजों का सो मुझे लगता है कि ये दोनों मुख्तलिफ फेसेज हैं एक दूसरे के अगर हम मजामत की तरफ भी आते हैं तो वो कहीं ना कहीं किसी ना किसी शक्ल में लोगों से मोहब्बत का इजहार है लोगों से आपका जो ताल्लुक है उसको उसकी बुनियाद पे आप अपने लिए और उनके लिए जो है उन पर उनके साथ जो हो रहा है और आपके साथ जो हो रहा है उसके लिए आवाज उठाना चाहते हैं अगर आपका रिलेशन उनके साथ जुड़त है किसी तरह की अदरवाइज अगर आप उनसे मजहब अगर आप उनसे किसी तरह की जुड़त नहीं रखते किसी तरह का ताल्लुक नहीं रखते जो जाहिर है इंसानियत की बुनियाद पर या एक नस्बी बुनियाद पर हो मोहब्बत की बुनियाद पर जब तक आप उनसे वो जुड़त नहीं रखते जब तक आपके लिए कोई जवाब नहीं आमतौर पर आप जवाब नहीं ढूंढ पाते कि उनके लिए आवाज उठाने का बेगानगी आपके लिए होती है तो मेरा ख्याल ये कि बहरहाल मोहब्बत और मजामत जो है वो एक ही चीज की एक ही चीज के हवाले से मुख्तलिफ शक्लें हैं जहां तक ताल्लुक है मोहब्बत के ना तमाम होने का और पूरा होने पा हो पाने का या नहीं तो जिसे एक लाइन मैंने एक नज्म के उसमें लिखी थी कि मोहब्बत की नज्में लिखने का वक्त चौराहों पर प्ले कार्ड था में जिंदा रहने का हक मांगने में खर्च हो गया सो ये अब होगी या नहीं होगी इसका तय तय करना तो एक मुश्किल सवाल है लेकिन हाँ बहरहाल जिस तरह मजामत एक उसके सामने तौर पे समझा जाए उसी के ग्रुप के तौर पर समझा जाए तो हाँ बहुत हद तक मुख्तलिफ शक्लों में ये इसका इजहार भी और होता रहा है और ये पूरी भी होती रही है थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू फॉर योर आंसर्स देर आर सम क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द ऑडियंस दैट आई विल डेफिनेटली गेट टू इन मोमेंट्स डोंट वरी ऑडियंस आई एम अवेयर ऑफ योर क्वेश्चन I just wanted to ask the two authors a question of my own um, that relates to both of your work and your practice, which is, and I think um, Salman's poetry also speaks to this, and Amar and Salman and Amar's life and practice speak to this, which is the fact that in Pakistan, whether you're a writer or you know of somebody who writes literature or a professor, um, artist. Uh, there is a kind of divide that is created uh, between politics and literature and academic output and i think there is sometimes folks like yourselves or even ourselves are criticized for crossing this boundary between art or academic production and politics like it's the job of an artist or an intellectual to stay neutral and so a lot of people criticize people like yourselves for that and of course you've got both gotten in trouble for that uh salman of course now in exile really for that and amar out of work and with sedition charges for that so if you can both speak to that kind of divide that's created here between the artist the intellectual and the political activist and then i can open it up for some of the audience questions um yes thank you to that, that this is a pretty intense uh, question a real question for us in pakistan um uh, partly because uh, you know it's uh pakistan the pakistani academia is not as big as the western academy which is very insulated from society at at some level 
um, we we often, I mean, you know, academics here are often writers in mainstream newspapers or or um, come on TV shows or join the government. So this is something. One, I don't think the academic culture is the same where you can have your own bubble for too long. Particularly if you're in the public sector, you're part very active in trade union movement with the, te with the teachers' associations and others. So there's some kind of um, a politic politics that's always there. But more importantly, I think the problem for critical academics is that there there were always red lines and even if you were not cro crossing those red lines, the red lines would cross you sometimes uh, because these were always very flexible. So something that was acceptable six years ago. Um, I remember teaching in 2011 and 2012 and we could get away with a lot of things. All of a sudden by 2017, 18, uh, the same things uh, were taboo and you couldn't really tell. And it became so whimsical that you really, you had, uh, colonels who were looking at universities, who were monitoring academics, who were monitoring students. Um, I often tell the story about uh, the experience at former Christian college where I was told by a colonel that uh, we, we really like your work, but your problem is you discuss too much politics in class. And I told him that's fine, but the problem is I'm a political science professor. So it's very difficult to like teach political science without discussing politics. So you have like these mediocre people, these mediocre men with too much power. And if the interference is coming from them, uh, they're the ones who are forcing us to take political positions. If you enter classrooms, if you enter university campuses, if you say that universities are frontline um, are the front line in this so-called fifth generation war where you know we're fighting enemies through ideas and the idea enemies have penetrated our universities like you Nida, myself others who are like brainwashing uh, uh, these innocent children to to be against pakistan you've basically they've turned universities into war zones uh, and this is how they they present it so when when the war comes to you then i think we're left with very little option but to fight back and, the, and I think this is a defensive strategy. Uh, we, there is, has been a militarization of campuses. Students are angry, professors are alienated, critical thinking is curbed, uh, dissent is, is punished. And to, to have a functional academy, I think we're left with no option but to resist. Now, if you call that politics, uh, I think we should completely be proud of doing that kind of politics because we are doing a politics that, that defends the, the basic architecture of an academic life, the basic architecture of universities, which the state wanted to demolish in order to turn these into like factories producing mediocre ideas that come from elsewhere, that come from the state. So they don't want independent universities, independent of politics. They don't want apolitical universities. They want highly politicized universities, but politicized only through uh, the propaganda of, of the right through the propaganda of the state. <clears throat> and I think it was our moral duty, our ethical duty to challenge that propaganda. And I think we all should be proud that we have uh, resisted that, that intrusive behavior, even if we've momentarily lost, but also uh, be proud of the fact that there's so many young people who are fighting back on campuses and who we're in touch with that who are, who, who are, who are leading uh, the defense of critical thinking on campuses. Shukriya Nida, my where the writers' ke hawale se baat hai. Pakistan ke hawale se, I think that the government ko ek amumi sata par riyasat ne, jis tarah ek uske baare mein corruption ke hawale se gustu karke, usko ek usko jis se kena chahiye ek buri buri jis ke tar pe. मतलब उसके बारे में जो इमेज कायम किया है वो ये कि सियासत कोई बुरी चीज होती है सो so, लोग जो लिखने वाले हैं वो अपने आप को अक्ली सतह पर या किसी हिस्तियात की सतह पर एक आम आदमी से ऊपर उठा हुआ समझते हैं और उसकी बुनियाद पर उन्हें महसूस होता है 
कि सियासत के बारे में बात करना या सियासत पर जो है कमेंट करना जो है वो शायद कोई अदीब के लेवल का काम नहीं है अगर हम खास तौर पे उन जिसे हम ये कहते हैं जो मुकामी सो कॉल्ड जिन्हें मुकामी जबाने कहते हैं हालांकि वो उन जिसे कहते हैं पाकिस्तान जिन इलाकों पे है उनकी जमीन से जुड़ी हुई जमाने हैं उसमें आपको मलामती शायरी पॉलिटिक्स पर बात बहुत ज्यादा मिलती है एज कम्पेयर टू उर्दू के आप उर्दू के शायरों में उर्दू के लिखने वालों में एक हाथ की उंगलियों पर गिन सकते हैं कि कितने लोग हैं जो सियासत से अपने आप को जोड़ते हैं आपको पांच सात दस नाम नजर आएंगे और उसके बाद लेकिन अगर आप पंजाबी की तरफ चले जाएं मैं क्योंकि ज्यादातर मैंने पंजाबी ही चीजों को सुना है और पढ़ा है लिहाजा मैं बाकी जबानों के बारे में कमेंट नहीं कर सकता लेकिन जिस तरह भी फहमीदा रियाज का नाम बता रही थी उन्होंने बहुत हद तक सिंधी के साथ जोड़ा है अपने आप को और बहुत उनके मतलब उनके नजर आती है ट्रांसलेशन जैसे पढ़ने को मिलती है शेख अयाज के काम की और तो सिंधी के अंदर पंजाबी के अंदर बहुत ज्यादा मटीरियल है उन जबानों में बहुत ज्यादा लिखा गया है उन जबानों में सियासत के बारे में जिनकी जुड़त जो है वो पाकिस्तान के अंदर जमीन के साथ है उर्दू के हवाले से उर्दू में बहुत ज्यादा लिखा गया है शायद बाकी जबानों के मुकाबले में लेकिन उसकी जुड़त सियासत के साथ नहीं बनती खासतौर पर हम देखते हैं जैसे कराची के अंदर एक बाकायदा पूरा ग्रोह ग्रुप है उर्दू स्पीकिंग लोगों का बड़ा सारा और एक एक अलहदा आइडेंटिटी के साथ वो वहां मौजूद है और वहां पर रियासत का जबर बहुत ज्यादा है बहुत जगहों में मुकाबले में लेकिन हमें वहां उस तरह रेजिस्टेंस की बहुत ज्यादा शायरी बहुत ज्यादा अफसाने में इन चीजों में नहीं देखने को मिलता हालांकि वो मतलब इस वो इलाका ये तो नहीं है कि वो नहीं देख रहा जबर को या उनके यहाँ ये सब कुछ नहीं हो रहा मुझे ये लगता है कि किसी हद तक जमीन के साथ जुड़े हुआ होना एक लोगों के साथ जुड़े हुए होना ओवरऑल माशरे के वो शायद बहुत जरूरी एलिमेंट है सियासत को देखने के हवाले से और सियासत से जुड़ने के हवाले से तो शायद ये एक चीज ऐसी लगती है मुझे जिसकी वजह से फर्क है इन दोनों से to bring him back into the conversation because i know he wants to also say a few words and then we can take some of the questions from the audience yeah i think we can we can take um, questions from the audience i have um listed some of them do you want me to go ahead and yeah go ahead and yeah. okay so one of them i think i think salman has already answered this question by sagheer sheikh who was sheikh who was asking about uh, you know um themes of of resistance poetry in in sindhi and sufi poetry there is another question by um, shadija um, sharma um he wants to know about you know and this for you salman bhai uh, normalization of violence at all levels in south asia um and so so how does that you know at the level of domestic minority gendered and poor bodies it's um, creating an abject vulnerable citizenship so i i guess um, the question is also like what kind of um, of resistance poetry perhaps if you could talk about that which is emerging from uh, from from india and um for uh, for amar this question by uh, asim fayaz um has our politics graduated from blaming the stereotypical enemy slash foreign um threat um to a larger omnipotent enemy that is the west so it's from india as an enemy to the west and that india is no longer enough to distract the public from real issues um so fueling separatist activities can now be attributed to the us so do you think that there is uh, this um, kind of like shift which is uh, which is happening and we have other questions as well but if you could just uh, respond to these two first should i go uh, okay fine i'll i'll go first um i think uh, uh, this the kind of state that we have in pakistan which is more than a insecure more than a security state is an insecurity state it is constantly insecure uh, about its own power so it needs an external enemy uh, in order to hold itself together and this we've seen in the past uh, it's been india india i think there's almost like a tacit uh, unsaid agreement between the indian and the pakistani ruling elites uh, whereby they use each other in order not to attack the other country but to mostly to discipline internal dissent so anybody who's 
decent uh, in India who talks about constitutional rights, who talks about human rights, becomes an ISI or Pakistani agent. And anybody in Pakistan who talks about basic rights becomes an Indian agent. So it's 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 a, it's it's almost like decent people on both sides of the border uh, are not acceptable to their governments and are accused of being on the payroll of the enemy's uh, government. Now, I think what's happened recently is that uh, I think this this uh, um, this America bashing also has a history. It's been uh, I think the America's role in during the war on terror in Pakistan was outrageous at many levels. It was supporting uh, a military dictator. The drone strikes were incredibly unpopular. Uh, uh, then what the IMF has done to Pakistan over the past many years has been um, uh, is, is very difficult to justify. Um, I think what's happening now, uh, uh, however, is, is that uh, the Imran Khan government, uh, which uh, failed at the, at, at the internal on the internal front, failed to revive the economy, in fact, surrendered economic sovereignty to, uh, to the IMF by, by handing over the state bank to, an IMF, to a governor from the IMF. Uh, he, he, he's trying to revive his popularity by externalizing his, uh, it's by externalizing the power addictions and saying the U.S. was behind everything, and that also is uh, is a good strategy for him because he, this way he does not have to name General Bajwa or any of the uh, top leadership of the Pakistani military. So America is still safer because it's an abstract category. If he names and shames military generals, uh, that can have severe consequences, physical consequences for him and uh, his party members. So I think it, uh, America is a very real problem in, in Pakistan, has been, uh, one can say, almost since 1950s in, in, uh, in the way it has tried to control Pakistan's political economy. However, I think uh, Imran Khan's uh, recent uh, turn towards anti-Americanism is very cynical, precisely because he uh, surrendered, as I said, he surrendered economic sovereignty to America and did not do much to challenge American hegemony, even rolled back on Chinese projects in Pakistan. But in the last few weeks, he's emerged as, as this anti-American figure to uh, cynically abuse the genuine sentiment of anger against American involvement in Pakistan. That's my opinion. जहां तक वायलेंस के हवाले से आ, सवाल था आ, मुझे अभी ये सवाल सुन के और उससे याद आ रहा है यकीनन वायलेंस जो है वो बहुत आ, बढ़ चुकी है और आ, जिसे कहना चाहिए कि अगर हम दायरा स्टेट की तरफ से बहुत बढ़ चुकी है जो स्टेट को उसको चंद जैसे कहें मुस्तशनियात को छोड़ के अगर हम जैसे कहना चाहिए पश्चून तहफुज मूवमेंट की बात कर लें जो खुलम खुला ये कहते हैं कि नहीं हम पुरान अमन तौर पर मजामत करेंगे या जो किसानों की मूवमेंट्स हैं जैसे उखाड़ा के हवाले से तंजीम है उन लोगों का जो है वो बहरहाल अभी तक किसी मुसल्लाह मजामत के हवाले से गुफ्तु नहीं लेकिन बहरहाल बलोचिस्तान में चल रही है मुख्तलि जगहों पर माशरे के अंदर हो रही है मजामत और वायलेंस के साथ हो रही है मुझे याद है कि लेट नाइन्टीज में नाइन्टीज में पंजाब में पूरी लहर आई थी अः मजहबी बुनियाद पर फिर वाराना बुनियाद पर लोगों को कत्ल कर देंगी तो हम उस जमाने में मैं लेट टीन्स में बहुत जैसे कहें ये पुरजोश पसंद के नौजवानों वाली एक उम्र में था तो ये गुफ्तु चल रही थी कि शिया हजरात को हथियार उठा लेने चाहिए उन्हें लड़ना चाहिए उन्हें रिस्पॉन्ड करना चाहिए ये जो कुछ उनके ऊपर मस्जिदों में मजालिस पे धमाके हो रहे थे सब कुछ हो रहा था तो बहुत सारे दोस्त जो है वो उसमें थे कि शिया हजरात को वो उठा लेने चाहिए हथियार उठा लेने चाहिए और उसको रिस्पॉन्ड करना चाहिए तो एक साहब जिन जो नस्बता मतलब ज्यादा संजीदा उसके थे और ज्यादा इस मामले को समझते थे लेकिन उनका जो ताल्लुक जो था वो नौजवानों के साथ था तो उन्होंने एक बहुत अच्छी बात की थी मजे की बात की थी उन्हें कहा था कि यार हथियार उठाने के बारे में फैसला करना बहुत आसान होता है लेकिन ये फैसला करना बहुत मुश्किल होता है कि हथियार कब रख देने चाहिए उठा लेना बहुत आसान है 
رکھ دینا بہت مشکل ہے آپ کس وقت اس نتیجے میں پہنچتے ہیں کیونکہ جب آپ ایک دفعہ اٹھا لیتے ہیں بدامت کے ساتھ جب وائلنس جڑ جاتی ہے تو پھر بہت مشکل ہو جاتا ہے اس وجہ سے ظاہر ہے بہت جو لوگ بہت وہ ہیں ان کے ساتھ بھی گفتگو میں انگیج کرتے ہوئے یا اس کو بنیادی طور پر یہی سمجھانے کی یہی بات کرنے کی کوشش کی جاتی ہے کہ جس اس کو جس حد تک آپ بغیر وائلنٹ ہوئے ریسپونڈ کر سکیں اتنا بہتر ہے لیکن بہت ساری صورتحال ہاں ایسی ہیں یہاں پر جہاں پر اسٹیٹ کے جبر کو دیکھتے ہوئے یہ لوگوں کو کہنے کی سمجھانے کی ہمت بھی نہیں پڑتی کہ تم لوگ ہتھیار نہ اٹھاؤ یا تم اس پہ مطلب اگر آپ بلوچستان کی صورتحال میں کسی بلوچ دوست سے بات کر رہے ہوں تو کم سے کم میری کبھی ہمت یہ نہیں ہوئی کہ میں ان سے کہہ سکوں کہ ہاں تمہاری جو مزاحمت ہے اگر تم اس کے بجائے پر امن سیاسی مزاحمت کرو تو شاید زیادہ بہتر ہو جو صورتحال ان کے ساتھ ہے مجھے نہیں سمجھ میں آتا کہ اگر ایسی صورتحال ہو تو آپ کیسے کسی کو سمجھا سکیں گے کہ وہ کم سے کم وائلنس نہ کریں اور معاشرے میں وائلنس کا لیول کم ہو سکے مجھے نہیں معلوم کہ میں پورے طریقے سے سوال کا جواب دے سکوں یا نہیں لیکن یہ سلمان جو ہندوستان میں بھی چل رہا ہے اور سٹیزن شپ لا کو جس طرح وہ اس میں ترمیم کر رہے ہیں اور اس کے اگینسٹ بھی ایک بڑی زبردست لہر ہندوستان میں اور وہ شاہین باغ کے پروٹیسٹ اور جو وہاں سے مزاحمتی شاعری ابھر رہی ہے اس پر اگر آپ کی اس پر نظر ہے تو ہم اس پر آپ کے کامنٹس تھوڑے سے لیں گے وہ بھی اردو زبان میں ظاہر ہے اور ہمارے ہاں جس طرح آپ نے بھی گلا کیا کہ اردو زبان میں ویسی شاعری نہیں ہوتی اور عمار آپ سے میرا سوال یہ تھا کہ یو نو آئی اباؤٹ عمران خان بٹ یو نو ان دا گیون کائنڈ آف لائک پولیٹیکل سینریو اٹ سیمس دیٹ ہی از دا اونلی پرسن who has some kind of a vision that he believes in something so you might say and we can say that it's it's regressive and that's a very self orientalizing vision of of islam uh and a kind of like an imagined history of the past and kind of a yearning for um you know uh, um, um, an empire like um, civilization and its role but nonetheless i mean as compared to everyone else in the field you know he comes up with with some ideas and he articulates them th- these ideas uh as compared to others who doesn't who don't seem to have any kind of uh of a vision to to, to present right so isn't it like it's it's remindful of of some kind of um, of a historical precedent where you know if even if you provide a kind of a regressive uh, vision in the in the larger political um, um, field uh, people will latch on to it And, and that can become a very powerful source of, of mobilizing public opinion, right? So I thought if you could respond to that. Before you talk about it, I would like to say that I can follow a lot of people in India, which is the case of Shahidi or Shaheen Paak, I can follow a lot of people in India, but I can't comment on that, but I can 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 comment on that, لیکن جو میں بھی کسی حد تک جو بات کر رہا تھا کہ زمین سے جڑا ترکشنے والی اور اس چیز کی شاید وہاں پر جو اردو میں جو ورژن سامنے آ رہا ہوگا شاید جسے کہنا چاہیے کہ وہاں پر لوگوں کی اس کے حوالے سے جو شمالی ہند کی تہذیب کہہ لیں یا اردو کی تہذیب کہہ لیں اس کے ساتھ جڑت کے حوالے سے شاید وہاں پر لوگوں کی تعداد زیادہ ہوگی یا جو اس پر اس کو اس طرح لے کر چل رہے ہوں گے میں جس طرح ہم بات کر رہے تھے کہ جب مشرف کے خلاف موومنٹ چل رہی تھی پاکستان میں تو شہرام اظہر اور ہم لوگ عموماً وہاں پر سپریم کورٹ کے سامنے جو مکلا کے ساتھ مل کے احتجاج کر رہے ہوتے تھے اس پہ تو اس میں بہت چیزیں جو ہیں دیکھنے کی بات بہت مزے کی تھی مثلاً جالب کو ہمارے یہاں عام طور پر جو ہمارے سفاح ادیب ہیں وہ یہ سمجھتے ہیں کہ وہ فیض یا فراز کے مقابلے میں کم تر درجے کا شاعری میں لیکن جب آپ لوگوں کے ساتھ بات کر رہے ہوتے ہیں تو لوگ جالب کو رسپونڈ کرتے ہیں فیض کو یا فراز کو رسپونڈ نہیں کرتے آپ جلسے میں جہاں لوگوں کے گروہ کے سامنے بات کر رہے ہیں وہاں آپ ظاہر فیض کی ایک دو نظمیں جو بہت مشہور ہیں بہت دفعہ پڑھی جا گائی جا چکی ہیں وہ ان دو ان کو چند کو چھوڑ کے آپ جب کوئی نئی چیز سنانا چاہتے ہیں تو جالب کی نظم ایسی ہے جو لوگوں کو ایک دفعہ کی اس میں سمجھ میں بھی آتی ہے وہ اسے سراہتے بھی ہیں اسے رسپونڈ بھی کرتے ہیں لیکن اگر آپ فیض کی نظم وہاں پر سنانے کی کوشش کریں تو آپ کے آپ کو بہت سارے چہرے ایسے دیکھنے کو ملتے ہیں جو بالکل بلینک نظر آتے ہیں کیونکہ وہ اس کے ساتھ اس زبان کے ساتھ اور اس محاورے کے ساتھ 
और उस डिक्शन के साथ जुड़ नहीं रहे होते तो मैं इस किसी सिर्फ इस हद तक कह सकता हूँ कि शायद वहां पर जो उर्दू की हवाले से नजमें सामने आ रही होंगी वो ज्यादा जुड़ी हुई होंगी वहां के उस माहौल के साथ और शायद वहां पर ज्यादा बिस्तर तौर पर रिस्पॉन्ड किया जा रहा है माजरत मैंने वहां पर कोई बहुत ज्यादा फॉलो नहीं किया जी थैंक यू फॉर योर क्वेश्चन कैसम साहब आई कंप्लीटली एग्री विद यू आई मीन दैट्स दैट्स द ट्रेजिडी ऑफ पाकिस्तानी पॉलिटिक्स दैट इमरान खान अपेयर्स टू बी एन इंटेलेक्चुअल इन इन द पोलिटिकल स्फियर बिकॉज यू नो द अदर्स वायल इन प्रैक्टिस दे वेरी गुड एट अंडरस्टैंडिंग पॉलिटिक्स इन टर्म्स ऑफ वीलिंग एंड डीलिंग इन टर्म्स ऑफ नोइंग द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ प्लूरिटी इन पॉलिटिक्स नोइंग दैट यू कैनॉट हैव uh only one person or one party uh bulldozing everything you know there's a better understanding of institutions but in terms of a grand vision for politics um uh i think imran khan is the only person who has them and that's i think that's a bigger crisis for left liberals across the world um uh, usually it was the left that used to give uh big ideas on how to transform society how to revolutionize politics um and the right was supposed to be conservative they were called conservatives because they wanted to conserve the status but it seems like for the past 20 15 20 years uh the the left is has been forced into a situation where it is defensive where it is trying to conserve the status quo defending constitution defending human rights defending civil liberties whereas the right is very bold with its idea sometimes of re re restoring the caliphate or making america great again or uh or or modi's project uh, hindutva project so they it, these are grand ideas that of course are terrible when implemented however uh they they are nonetheless ambitious and i think if we want to fight back against the right uh we have to come back with some grand thinking some big ideas we cannot let people like imran khan or modi or or boris johnson or trump to be the only uh philosopher kings of our times uh, we need we need we need to raise the standards uh, of political discussion within uh the political sphere yeah, yeah. and um yeah this lastly there's one question which is um uh based on what other people have also been saying so i'll just um it's a one line question as to how we can build solidarities um whether whether it's like across the border or regionally or globally with uh, with progressive forces um and i would like um both of you to respond and also professor farooqi if you if you, if you could also say as to you know uh, as you were referring to you know um, uh, this resistance poetry emerging from from india as to you know how these connections can be can be made um yeah let me let yeah. me comment a little bit about this resistance poetry Poetry has always been the media, the 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 via media, the means to express resistance. Always, uh, poets were dissidents. Poets could say things about, uh, you know, Mir could say anything and get away with it. Ghalib could say anything and get away with it. Uh, so poetry has always had that privilege of being the voice of dissent. But having said that. Uh, and to connect with your question about the caa protests and and the role of poetry emerging from it what i saw mostly was poetry was pulled into this discourse but it was more from the poet who are who we are familiar with like habib talib and uh, faiz and all of those um, poets and and even majaz people scarred scarred the the divans and they pulled out those poems and they they wrote them on the walls uh basically i would agree with salman that uh poetry of dissent in urdu is difficult because urdu itself has those you know it, there are those classical metaphors that you have to reinvent and re restructure and reorient 
to talk about these harsh things that Salman talks about in his poetry. So, I mean, to him was some credit for um, saying things that were not typically poetic, I would say, um, you know, talking about subjects that are not considered to be poet, poet, poetry worthy. Um, but what we have seen in India is actually a huge, huge pushback to um, stand up comedy. That has really taken off with this whole thing about Modi and resistance. So we've seen a lot of uh, stand up comedians poking, uh, you know, fun and punchlines, and things. some of them have been punished, uh, like Munawar Farooqi. Of course, if you're a member of the minority, the act falls on your head. But still, there has been a healthy uh, dissent against the policies of repression in India. So I think that's my opinion. Ji, um, Salman, uh... اس طرح ڈاکٹر فاروقی نے بھی ذکر کیا کہ ایکسپریشن میں ظاہر رہی ہے ہمیشہ سے شاعری کی اس میں تو میرا خیال یہ کہ بہت حد تک جو بھی جب ہم بات کرتے ہیں تو ثقافتی لنکس جو ہیں وہ ہمارے بہت حد تک ایک امپورٹنٹ کردار ادا کر سکتے ہیں لوگوں کے درمیان جڑت بنانے کے لیے خاص طور پر جس طرح اگر ہم پنجاب اور سوری پاکستان اور انڈیا کے حوالے سے گفتگو کر رہے ہوں تو ہمارے اس میں وہ بن سکتے ہیں ایک بہت بڑا جسے کہنا چاہیے تعلق ثقافتی بنیادیں ہمارا بہت بڑا تعلق بن سکتی ہیں کیونکہ بہرحال سندھ کا بہت بڑا راجستان کے ساتھ اور پنجاب کا دونوں اس کے ساتھ وہ بہت بڑا ہمارا ہے اور اتفاق ایسا ہے کہ ہم نے ظاہر ہے جو پاکستان کی آئیڈینٹی بنائی ہے اس بنیاد پہ بلڈ کی ہے کہ انڈیا کو ہم نے خاص اینگل سے خاص نظر سے دیکھنا تو اس وجہ سے ہم بہت حد تک وہ رہے ہیں جس میں اب کم سے کم پنجاب کی حد تک کوئی تھوڑی بہت تبدیلی آ رہی ہے میرا خیال یہ کہ ثقافتی چیزیں جو ہیں وہ ثقافتی عناصر ظاہر اس میں شاعری بھی ہے اس کی ڈرامہ ہے بہت ساری چیزیں ہیں کہ جو جڑت کا ایک بہت بڑا سبب بن سکتی ہیں آئی کمپلیٹلی اگری آئی تھنک الوٹ آف دا سوشل اینڈ پولیٹیکل پرابلمس ان پاکستان اینڈ انڈیا talk more broadly of South Asia with Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and, and I think and, and Afghanistan and, and Nepal. Um, I think it's very important to see how these governments already have a very sub at a subconscious level they have united South Asia in hate in 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 scapegoating citizens they they are using their own they're using the other countries uh, in order to discipline their populations in order to uh, curtail any form of dissent so there's there's a, an internationalism or regionalism of the elites which is pitting in, uh, citizens of one country against another so it's a, it's a it's a regional strategy and i think we've uh, lost out uh, on on opportunities to build a people's alliance a people's regionalism which actually centers our common grievances our common suffering and i think this is true both internally in every country where you know elites uh, use uh, fissures within uh, populations to pit them against each other and also regionally uh, and i think the task is to overcome these divisions to see uh, how these different forms of, of uh, sub repression, of pain, of suffering can be translated into a common language, uh, into a, perhaps a common politics and a common vision for South Asia. I think it's very, very important that in today's globalized uh, world, uh, we, we at least think regionally, if not uh, internationally, and that means Uh, working with our allies across the region who are fighting for human rights, for human dignity, for more, for more equitable redistribution of resources, for an end to militarization. Uh, we need to see them as our partners, as our comrades, and, and think collectively uh, for a different kind of, kind of South Asia, because I think our destiny is collective and we have to reimagine a collective destiny for our region. I think that's a, I think that's a hopeful note for us to, to end on. I know we could all keep talking for hours. There's the endless amount of things we could say and more questions um, that I'm sure we all have for each other. But 
It is a little bit late in Pakistan's 11 p.m. Um, and this discussion has been amazing, energizing, um, also saddening. I think the poetry especially really brought out the human pain and suffering caused by this um, logic of fear that the state operates under. Um, and I think both of these works together really bring out that um, both the pain, but the importance of hope and resistance and both of your work and your lives are testaments to that. And you are both uh, inspirations for us. Um, and Dr. Faruqi, your comments were extremely um, poignant and you brought the works together really beautifully. And so we really appreciate that. Um, thank you, Ali, and thank you, Stanford, for hosting this event. These events are also acts of resistance, and we really appreciate you giving us this opportunity. And thanks to the audience for sticking it out and for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>